Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. This is the first of a four-part video on the solar system, in which we'll discuss the main objects in our solar system, the size of the solar system, and how orbits work. In the next three videos we'll talk about the planets in more detail, how we have explored the solar system, and how the solar system formed. Anybody watching this video probably knows the names of the eight planets and their order from the Sun, but we didn't always count eight planets, and this number has varied through the centuries. Planet comes from planetis, the Greek word for wanderer. The ancient Greeks saw the fixed stars, which rotated in the heavens, but did not change their relative positions from each other. On the other hand, seven objects wandered the sky, the original planets, the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. Over time, both Indian and Islamic astronomers proposed alternate ideas closer to what we have today. When the heliocentric model became widely accepted in the 17th century, the Sun and Moon were excluded, but the Earth was included. We now had six planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. With more advanced telescopes came the discovery of smaller objects orbiting the Sun, and in 1807 we had 11 planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Vesta, Juno, Ceres, Pallas, Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus. By 1854 we had realised that most of these new planets were very small, and they were reclassified as asteroids. We had eight planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. In 1930 we discovered a new planet, bringing the total up to nine, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. In 2006, as we discovered more and more objects of similar size to Pluto, the International Astronomical Union adopted a formal definition of planet which excluded Pluto, giving us our current eight planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. This reclassification in 2006 left a lot of people unhappy and Pluto was given a special status. The new definition of planet requires that the planet is in orbit around the Sun, has sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium, basically it's round, and has cleared the neighbourhood around its orbit. Pluto satisfies the first two conditions but not the third since there are many other large bodies nearby. So Pluto and four other bodies were called dwarf planets. In order, the eight planets and five dwarf planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Ceres, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, Haumea, Makemake and Eris. We'll talk about each of these in more detail in part two. Now we come to small solar system objects, as the GCSE calls them, or more commonly small solar system bodies. There are countless billions of these bodies, which include anything that directly orbits the Sun and isn't a planet, dwarf planet or moon. Artificial spacecraft also don't count. SSSOs include asteroids, meteoroids, comets, trojans, centaurs and transneptunian objects, among others. On the left you can see an Euler diagram of objects in the solar system, and on the right is a video of asteroid 2004 FH passing just 43,000 kilometres above the Earth. A minor planet is anything other than the Sun, a planet, a dwarf planet, a moon or a comet. The largest of these are asteroids. This is Greek for star-like because of their appearance through a telescope. Most asteroids orbit the Sun in the asteroid belt, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Ceres is the largest asteroid, at 950 kilometres in diameter. Ceres is also a dwarf planet, so technically isn't a small solar system object. Most asteroids are much smaller, down to one metre across, and too small for gravity to pull them into a spherical shape. Here you can see 253 Matilda, only 50 kilometres across. Asteroids are typically made of carbon compounds, silicon compounds and or metals. They would have formed their own planet, but Jupiter's gravity prevented this. More on this in part 4. Asteroids are one metre across or larger. Similar objects smaller than one metre are called meteoroids. The smallest, less than a gram in mass, are micrometeoroids, although this is no longer an official term. And anything smaller than a tenth of a millimetre is space dust. Most meteoroids are small pieces of rock or metal broken off from asteroids or comets, 
It's pretty obvious that meteoroids pose a hazard to space travel, but what about those tiny, harmless micrometeoroids? In fact, meteoroids typically travel at speeds around 10 km per second relative to spacecraft. A 1 gram micrometeoroid at that speed has a kinetic energy of 50 kilojoules, 50 times the kinetic energy of a bullet from a sniper rifle. The hole you can see here was caused by a micrometeoroid punching right through the Solar Max satellite. This also happens on the International Space Station. Standard procedure is for the astronaut who found it to plug the hole with their finger and ask their colleagues for some duct tape. A meteoroid that enters Earth's atmosphere becomes a meteor. These move through the air at very high speeds, typically 20 to 70 kilometers per second. At these speeds, they have extremely high kinetic energy. As they hit air molecules in front of them, they compress the air. This heats up the air and the meteor to as high as 2000 Kelvin, making the meteor disintegrate and shine brightly. Note that this heating is often said to be due to friction. This is not actually correct, although it's accurate to call the process air resistance. Meteors usually last for a second or less before burning up high in the atmosphere. They appear as a bright streak of light, about 2 to 10 degrees long. Millions of meteors occur every day, though most are too small and dim to be seen. But very large meteors can be especially bright, sometimes visible in the daytime as a spectacular fireball. A meteor that survives its journey through the atmosphere and lands on the Earth is called a meteorite. They are typically made of stone or iron, with their surfaces smoothed by their high temperature journey through the atmosphere. Meteorites are generally not dangerous, and despite rumours, there have been no confirmed human deaths although an Egyptian dog was killed by meteorite strike in 1911. Meteors get very hot in the upper atmosphere, but they quickly slow down and cool as they fall through the air, so landed meteorites generally aren't hot to touch. Most meteorites are micrometeorites, since most meteoroids are micrometeoroids. Micrometeorites are too small to heat up very much as they fall, so they generally don't burn up. However, Occasionally, a very large asteroid or comet hits the Earth. You can see here a map of the long-buried Chicks Club crater in Mexico, the landing site of an asteroid or comet somewhere between 11 and 81 kilometers in diameter, 66 million years ago. The impact is widely thought to have killed the dinosaurs due to the enormous amount of dust thrown into the atmosphere. This dust blocked sunlight, killing most plants and then starving most animals to death. However, some smaller dinosaurs survived, evolving into modern-day birds. Our last solar system object today is the comet. Comets spend most of their time in the outer solar system, rarely coming close enough to be seen, even with our best telescopes. Comets are made of ice and rock, and when they get close to the sun, some of their ice might vaporise. This releases gas and cracks open the rock to release dust as well. The gas and dust forms a coma, a spherical mini-atmosphere around the comet. The gas and dust are then pushed away from the comet by the solar wind, forming two tails. The gas tail becomes ionised and is strongly affected by the solar wind, making it point away from the sun. The dust tail is not ionised, so the solar wind affects it less. It points back in the direction the comet came from. If a comet gets close enough to Earth, we can see the comet and its tails clearly in the night sky. A bright comet like 1997's Halley Bopp, shown here, is a rare and special event and difficult to predict. In this image of Comet 17P Holmes, we can clearly see the coma surrounding the nucleus, as well as the gas or ion tail, though not the dust tail. Comets are mostly ice and rock, but also contain various organic compounds, including carbon dioxide and monoxide, methane, ethane, methanol and ethanol, ammonia, hydrogen cyanide and formaldehyde, and even long-chain hydrocarbons and amino acids. These mostly organic compounds are thought to have formed in the ancient nebula that created our solar system. Comets used to collide with Earth much more often, and some scientists suggest that these comets seeded our planet with these compounds and are the origin of life on Earth. We'll discuss the orbits of comets in part two. That covers most of the important objects in our solar system. Now, let's talk about their distance from us. 
the solar system is huge. The sizes and distances are mind-boggling, and ordinary numbers become a bit useless. The moon is 380,000 kilometres away, which is hard to comprehend, but the sun is a staggering 150 million kilometres away. These numbers get difficult to work with, so we often use astronomical units, or AU. An astronomical unit is the mean distance between the Earth and the Sun, 1.5 times 10 to the power 8 kilometres. This unit makes it much easier to compare distances in the solar system. If I tell you that Jupiter orbits the Sun at 757 million kilometres, that probably doesn't tell you much. But if I say it orbits the Sun at 5.2 astronomical units, you immediately know Jupiter is 5.2 times as far out as the Earth. These figures are rounded averages, so you may find slightly different numbers elsewhere. Wherever the astronomy GCSE gives specific values, I'll use those. By the 17th century, astronomers knew the relative distances of the planets from the Sun. In other words, how many astronomical units away from the Sun they orbited. But finding the actual distances was a lot harder. So, in 1677, English astronomer Edmund Halley, famous for analysing the orbit of Halley's Comet, came up with a way of measuring the size of the astronomical unit using transits of Venus across the Sun. Solar transits of Venus are rare, and Halley did not live to see any. But after his death, a team of astronomers used Halley's method to accurately measure the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and therefore the distances between all known objects in the solar system. In 1769, 120 astronomers around the globe observed the transit of Venus. Astronomers at different latitudes simply measured the length of time Venus took to move across the face of the Sun. Due to parallax, this time was different at different latitudes. The astronomers knew their latitudes and their distances from each other. With a bit of trigonometry, they were able to determine the distance to the Sun within 2.5% of the value we use today. This is all you need to know for the GCSE, but if you would like to know the maths involved, I've linked a post on Physics Stack Exchange in the description of the video. Finally today, we'll talk about how orbits work. For centuries, planets were thought to orbit the Earth, and later the Sun, in perfect circles. This didn't match observations, so astronomers used a complex system of epicycles to adjust the circular orbits to fit their data. I discuss this in more detail in the video The Heliocentric Model. But in 1605, Johannes Kepler suggested that planets orbit the Sun in ellipses. This is a simpler and more accurate fit to observational data, and remains, more or less, our current understanding. An ellipse is a squashed circle. It has two focuses, or rather foci. Mathematicians define an ellipse as a curve, such that the sum of the distances from the two foci to any point on the curve is a constant. An ellipse has an eccentricity, which is a numerical measure of its squashedness. Eccentricity 0 gives a perfect circle, and eccentricity 1 gives a straight line. This ellipse has eccentricity 0.7. This is a very high eccentricity, exaggerated to make it easier to see what's going on. The highest eccentricity of any planet in our solar system is Mercury, at just 0.2. An orbit is the motion of a low-mass body around a much more massive parent body. The planets orbit the Sun, and the Moons orbit planets. Orbits follow a perfect ellipse if we ignore the gravitational influence of other nearby bodies. The high-mass body is at one of the foci, with the other empty focus having little interest to astronomers. More accurately, the focus is at the centre of mass of the two bodies, called the barycentre, and both bodies orbit around that. However, the barycenter is usually very close to the centre of the parent body, so we can usually ignore this. We have special names for some locations in an orbit. The location closest to the parent body is called the periapsis, and the location furthest from the parent body is called the apoapsis. These are generic words. Peri is Greek for around, apo is Greek for away from, and apsis is Greek for orbit. The plural is apsides. Individual bodies often have their own words to replace apsis, and you should know two of them. For the Sun, we have perihelion and aphelion, from Helios, the Greek god of the Sun. 
And for Earth, we have Perigee and Apogee, from Gaia, the Greek goddess of the Earth. We know from Kepler's laws that orbiting bodies move fastest at periapsis and slowest at apoapsis. I discussed Kepler's laws in the heliocentric model, and we'll consider the role gravity plays in orbits in part four of the solar system. For now, you should know that this is due to conservation of energy. At aphelion, planets have high gravitational potential energy. As they approach perihelion, they are literally falling towards the sun. Their gravitational potential energy decreases and their kinetic energy increases. They speed up. If you'd like to learn more about orbits, I highly recommend playing Kerbal Space Program. It's about £30, but a lot of fun and highly educational. I honestly learnt more about orbital mechanics playing KSP than I did in four years at university studying astrophysics. This is a genuine personal recommendation, as I don't accept sponsorship on this channel, though the game's publishers were kind enough to give me permission to use their logo here. That's it for part one. Here are four summary screens for this video. The first screen is given to you at the front of the GCSE exam paper, so you don't need to memorise it. In part two, we'll take a closer look at the planets, as well as the orbits of comets. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and have an excellent day.